All right, how's Profusion going for you guys? Spending lots of money? <laughs> um, it's a great event. It's my first time at this event. I'm very thankful that, um, yeah, Canon asked me to come and, and speak about the 5DS over there, the booth, and the Greenland Adventure here. So um, a little bit about myself. My name is Paul Ziska. I'm a Banff-based photographer. I've been doing photography full-time for about mm, eight years now. And I'm a landscape and adventure guy. I do a little bit of commercial work for clients like Parks Canada. But other than that, it's, uh, it's, I try to spend my time in the wilderness as much as I can because that's why I got into photography. I think it's out of a love for the wilderness. And that's still what drives my efforts today, I think. It's a desire to document wild places. And I feel extremely privileged to wake up in Banff most days of the year. It's, an, it's a, as good as it gets for a base for, for landscape and nature photography. Um, and I'm thankful that photography, uh, through photography, I was able to explore other wild places. But today, I want to talk about one specific place that is really, really has become really dear to me, and that's Greenland. Anybody been to Greenland? Yeah, a few people. Awesome, like yesterday. Where'd you guys go? OK, yeah. Where did you guys go in Greenland? Did you guys go to, yeah? Oh, nice. Hey, how about you? Lusat, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where we're going now. Great, so for me, an adventure often starts by looking at a map. I'm a map geek. I could just look at maps forever. You're going to need some serious hardware if you want to pull me away from a, a table full of maps. I just, they make me dream. And they make me really curious about places, what, what places might look like and what it might be like to document them in the field. And out of all the beautiful corners of the earth, I've always been particularly fascinated by remote places. I have an unexplained passion for remoteness. I love strange places. I love places that are difficult to access. And, um, and therefore, I love places that are ser seriously underdocumented. Um, and I also love cold places. I've developed a sort of a love story with the Arctic over the last few years. And um, I really, really, high, I really like the, the high latitude. So given all that, I suppose it's not really surprising that one of the spots that I'd been looking at on the map for a very, very long time is the big white island at the top of it. And it just made me so curious. And I never knew too much about it at all, which for me was part of the appeal. And even if I served the internet, try as I might, I couldn't really find a whole lot of photographs from there. And, and for me, that was a huge, a huge um, upside to, you know, to getting there. The place, the place always seemed to hold so much magic for me. And it was remote, and it was wild, and hard to get to, and cold. So in my mind, it was the full package. It had it all. So Greenland had been on my radar for quite some time. And one night, I was, um, I was shooting on Baffin Island with a good friend of mine, Dave Brosha, who's a fellow photographer based out of PEI, and we had, we had spent the day um, teaching photography because we do a lot of workshops together. And that night, we were shooting the endless sunsets of Baffin Island, and we were talking about how cold it felt for the month of May. And then we started talking about, where would you go if you could lead a workshop anywhere else in the world? And of course, I said Greenland, even though I was I, I, had, I really had doubts um, in terms of, I, I felt like that was probably not anywhere close to where Dave, uh, to what Dave had in mind. He probably had palm trees, that, considering you just mentioned how cold it was for, for the month of May. But I guess he must have thought it was a good idea, because just five months later, we all hopped on a, he and I and Stephen Derosh, who's another PI photographer, we all hopped on an Air Greenland flight. And the goals of our first ever visit to Greenland, our 10-day visit, uh, were twofold. We, our first goal was just to shoot our hearts out. We, the three of us have kids now. We all have families. It's hard to find time. It's hard to find field time when you're home. When you're away from home, you go back to pre-fatherhood life, and you can just go nuts and don't sleep, and you, you're not very careful what you eat, and you just... You're like three little kids just shooting, and uh, we're, all, we're all, af all about the light. So, um, so we just go nuts for 10 days and have a blast. And we're, we all have that same purpose. The other reason why we were in Greenland for Dave and I was to scout out locations for a 2016 workshop. 
And this is what 99% of Greenland photos look like. It's, it's a, an iPhone shot taken through a greasy airplane window in a flight across the North Atlantic. And, you know, who hasn't flown across the North? Many people will relate to that, where you, you leave urban Canada and you'll go to another big city in Europe and you just get teased to tears by what's happening outside the window below you, this huge expanse of beautiful peaks and enormous glaciers, and it feels so close yet so far. And you see it on the way to Europe, and you see it on the way back to Europe, and all you can do is snap the quick iPhone shot. And as a photographer, as a landscape photographer, photographer I always felt like it, it was absolute torture. And up until this September, that was the extent of my own experience was with, with Greenland, just a handful of cell phone shots taken through the airplane on an Air Canada flight. And one of the reasons for that, that that was the extent of my experience, it's quite a trek getting to Greenland. Despite the fact that there's only 500 kilometers separating Greenland from Baffin Island, there's no direct flights. So unless you can row really well, you're gonna have to take a flight to urban Europe. And well, for me, it was take the bus from Banff to Calgary, take a flight from Calgary to London, London to Copenhagen, Copenhagen, so over Greenland and Copenhagen back over Greenland to reach the west side of Greenland where we wanted to go. Um, the, the upside of that is that, well, you see nice corners of Europe, you know, uh, I never thought I'd shoot downtown Copenhagen, but that, it, was, it was a nice little side trip. And then you can, in, within one day, you can drive up to Sweden and, and back to Copenhagen. Um, so we went on a little, little bit of a road trip that's a shot from coastal Sweden. But what we really, what we really come for was this. It was the end of the world feel, the very last airstrip, the, the incredibly isolated community, really the feeling that you're in the middle of nowhere. And that if you go a little bit further, you're just gonna, you're just gonna fall off the face of the earth into space. And so we arrived in Kangalusuak, shown here, on September 17th, which is the hub of Western Greenland, I guess it, if you can call it a hub. It's the kind of place where when the plane arrives, it's quite the event and, and it's the big day of the week sort of thing. Um, so we finally set foot on the mysterious island of Greenland on September 17th, so not too long ago. And we were delighted to find that the fall colors were still in their prime with beautiful oranges and goldens and reds just gracing the hillsides all around us. And here's a shot of Dave being completely overwhelmed by the opportunity. It's just a 10-minute walk from the airport. You're really never far from wilderness in Greenland. That's what's great. There's no really such thing as urban Greenland. You're never more than 20 minutes away from, um, from at least getting that feeling that you're just so far away from everything. So we briefly got acquainted with the, this not-so-green Greenland. As you can see, there's all the colors but green. And we hopped on one final plane to, um, to Ilulisat, which would be our base for the next 10 days. And you never, you never forget arriving in Ilulisat, I think. You agree? <laughs> all you see out of the plane window is ice and ice and ice and so much ice. And then all of a sudden, on this little tiny windswept peninsula, this little, those little clump of very colorful houses all huddled together. And then the first thing that comes to mind is, wow, people really live here? Like 365 days a year? It's just, yeah, it's just incredible. But yeah, they, they make it work. They casually go about their day, get their groceries and get their, get their, you know, their sled fixed or whatever. They casually do the things that everybody, but as, as massive chunks of ice just flows pa fl flow past their houses and it's like, yeah, it's just the, it's, it's so normal to them. It's, um, it's quite surreal, really. So the town of Ilulisat, you see it top left there, just to locate you a little bit. Um, it's it's right, on the, right on the edge of the ice fjord of the same name, the Ilulisat Ice Fjord. And as you can see, it's just chock full of ice. That's a photo, that's an aerial from Google Earth. And um, 40 kilometers away or so, on the right edge of the frame there, you have the famous Jakobshavn Glacier. And why is it famous? In the world of glaciers, it's really the superstar of glaciers. It's famous because it's the most productive glacier outside of Antarctica. And it releases 100 million tons of ice a day, which I, I have yet to wrap my mind around that. That's a ridiculous amount of ice. And its other claim to fame is that um, it's believed that the, uh, the glacier released the iceberg that sank the Titanic in 1912. 
So if you're ever in Newfoundland and you're just casually having a cup of coffee or something and a huge chunk of ice floats past your window, um, chances are that chunk of ice started as a way bigger chunk of ice back up there at the Jakobs Haven Glacier several months before. So 100 million tons of ice a day. What does that even mean? And how do you, as a little tiny human being, how do you start to comprehend that? And even if you grasp that, how do you convey it through photography? And I think that was the question that, I that was on a lot of people's minds, um, as definitely on my mind, uh, as, as we left town and headed towards the fjord, is how am I going to do justice to this place? And before we could take on that challenge of doing justice to the place, we had to set up camp. And our camp, our base camp in Ilulisat was just, just out of this world. Just so surreal. And we had a tent each, which we appreciated after spending 10 days in the wilderness. And we all had a fair bit of gear with us, so it was nice to be able to put the gear away um, comfortably. And then when we set up camp, there was just an explosion of cannon gear as we unpacked everything. We pretty much recreated the cannon booth that's just over there. Uh, in terms of gear for that trip, for anyone interested, we all went with the Canon 5D3 um, for reasons of versatility and durability. We knew we would be shooting pretty harsh environments. We, would, we knew we would be shooting a variety of light conditions. So we wanted something that would... Um, that would fit the bill, and the 5D Mark III, I don't think either, I don't think any of us regretted bringing that. We're quite happy with our choice. We also, uh, as far as glass goes, we all brought a wide angle, uh, which you need to have in Greenland. Um, I had the 1635 f2.8. We all had a telephoto, which I can, Stephen asked if he were, he almost, he told us he almost left his telephoto at home. He would have been in tears because playing around with the telephoto and shooting detail in the icebergs in Greenland is so, it's a huge part of the fun. So you need to have a good telephoto. For me, it was the 7200 f2.8. And then um, we're all into astrophotography. So we all had a prime lens for, uh, to be able to really gather up a lot of light at night. So for me, it was the 24 f1.4. So everything you, all the photos you see in this little presentation are all taken with Canon 5.3 and those lenses. And I would say we used everything extensively. It was one of those rare trips where we didn't get home wishing, looking at the gear, thinking, why the heck did I bring this? I never used it at all, which happens on pretty much all the trips. But in, in the case of this trip, I think we cycled through the gear pretty well. We ended up using everything. And the beauty of shooting ice in Greenland is that, as opposed to Antarctica, um, you're able to be based out of the land, which is really, really handy when you want stability to shoot that nice detail in the iceberg in low light, when the, the sunlight lingers in the atmosphere for so long after the sun is gone, and you get this beautiful, soft, pastel light uh, on the landscape. So for, yeah, for images like this, where you really zoom in and you, you, um, you really zoom in, you're shooting at the long end at 200 or something, it's really nice to be being, being based out of the land, shooting out towards the water. And it's just so great to be sitting just beside your tent, having the telephoto on a tripod, and then the icebergs just float right past you. And then you just, you know, you can spend hours just scanning the scene from left to right and looking for where the cool stuff is happening because it's always changing and just playing around it with a telephoto, which um, if you're based out of the boat, it's a little bit harder to do and to, to have that stability. Another great advantage, a great advantage of being based out of, uh, of the land in, in Greenland is that you can, well, you can try to use the, use the human element to convey a sense of scale. That's something we all struggled with over the 10 days, is how do we convey the sense of scale of this place? And I don't know if any of us managed to do that, but it helps to have the human element. So just to give the observer something that it can instantly relate to. So there's, there's Stephen trying to figure out where to start. And there's another, another self-portrait from an evening on, uh, on the ice fjord. And of course, another huge advantage to being on the land, um, shooting out towards the water, is playing around with long exposures, which, of course, not, so not something you can do if you're floating around on the boat. So for shots like this, where you want to um, you let, you let the chunks of ice just create a pattern of flow around some other ice, or whenever you want to smooth out 
you know, if you find the waves are distracting, it's really nice to be able to just use the thick filter and go with that 10, 20, 30 second exposure and let things smooth out a little bit. And just show the contrast between the icebergs that move and the icebergs that don't move. Here's a little piece of iceberg trivia for you. So to be called an actual iceberg, a chunk of ice needs to be five meters or more above sea level. If it's between five and one and five meters, it's called a bergy bit. <laughs> Very technical, of course. And then if it's less than one meter above sea level, it's just called a growler. And why does that matter for photography? Well, what, what tends to happen in this area is the actual icebergs, the one that have five meters or higher above sea level, often they're stranded and they're very still. So then we start to, when you start to play around with long exposures or at, at night, for example, they're the nice ones that you want to find because they give you that nice static subject. Whereas the other ones, anything smaller than five meters will tend to move around around it. So, um, so it's, nice to, um, it, it, it's nice to be able to have the, the thick filters play around with the long exposures and, and just emphasize that flow sometimes. So we spend our first evening just running around like little kids, just trying to, fit, trying to get a, a sense of scale for the place, trying to understand how big everything was around us. And as a guy who shoots in the Rockies quite a bit, I'm used to dealing with subjects of massive proportions. But the Ice Fjord was something else. Um, it, I don't know if you can see, there's two, two tiny people on that point there to give you a sense of how big those chunks of ice are just under the sun, but it gives you an idea of the sense of scale. Some of the icebergs at the back there are over 100 meters above sea level. And as some of you know, 90% of the iceberg volume is underwater. So if you do the math, you realize that in a case like this, you pretty much have a vertical kilometer of ice underwater, which is just astonishing. It's just mind-blowing to me. And um, we did have an underwater housing for the trip. Uh, the problem is when those things flip, you get in trouble pretty quick when you're shooting from sea level. So it's not something that you can do in that area. Uh, the, the, the area is known for its, uh, its silent waves that come and grab people and you don't see them coming and they, they seem to lose a local or two every year because of those, um, of those silent waves, which just sometimes it just means that a huge chunk of ice um, flipped just around the corner and you don't see it coming and you can easily get dragged into the ocean. So you have to be really, really conservative that way. So unless you're lucky enough to have the odd boat float past one of those chunks of ice, or unless you're lucky enough to have a bird hitch a ride on one of them, it's really hard to understand what you're looking at. So, and besides the size of everything, I think one thing that everybody notices when they go up to the Arctic, and Greenland in particular, is just the quality of the light. The endless side light. You know, the sunrises that just keep, that just keep on giving. And the sun said that whenever you think it can't get any better, it just does. The, just that beautiful ongoing side light. And we came to call the phenomenon the disco inferno, that frequent prolonged outburst of light. And that simply, that simply happens because at those latitudes, the, pat, you know, the, sh the trajectory of the sun is smoothed out quite a bit. So it takes its sweet time just dropping below the horizon and takes a long time to rise again. And if you're used to shooting in the mid-latitudes, like most of us, you know that typically when you see the bright pink and reds that you better get your act together because you got five minutes to get the shot and that color is gone. Whereas in Greenland, eventually you get used to the opposite happening and you learn to relax and you know that um, eventually you know that the light is there to stay and you can actually afford to take your time a little to take your time a little bit more and not you know, stumble about and trip on your own gear. There, it, it's, just, um, it's just amazing how long you can, everything's just like slow motion in terms of lighting. And the same, the same thing goes with the, the way the moon travels across the sky. The moon takes ages to rise up and it takes a really, really long time to dis disappear below the horizon again, which is great when you're based out of the land and you can sort of move around on the beach and try to line it up with different icebergs and different features and you don't have to run around too much. You have lots of time to work with it. 
One of the reasons why we wanted to go to Greenland in the fall is that we're all into astrophotography. So there was no question. We didn't want to go in July and August like I think like most, of, most visitors to Greenland go in July and August. There, there was no, no doubt in our minds that we wanted to avoid that because we really, really wanted the darkness to play with, with the cameras. And we figured that with ingredients like the aurora and stars and the icebergs and the almost near zero light pollution and the, the, the dramatic terrain. And with all those ingredients, we figured there's going to be incredible magic to, um, to document at night. And on a very, very first night out, we found the green in Greenland. It's a self-portrait taken at camp. And for Stephen, it was his first time seeing the aurora. So he's usually a very quiet, reserved guy. It takes a lot to get him excited. Um, and even when we saw the chunks of ice, he was still, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. And he's excited inside, he just doesn't demonstrate very much. But that night, he was just like a little kid. And in his excitement, he just he stumbled out of this tent and he tripped on his guy line and he was carrying his tripod and, and wide angle and the, <laughs> and the gear went flying. And th thankfully, the gear did not get damaged, everything made it. But Dave and I pretty much had to, to have a talk with him and say, Hey, look, we got nine nights left. We'll probably see lots more of Northern Lights. And you, you're probably going to want your gear to shoot it, so don't wreck it on day one. And for, for hours on that first night, the lights danced, and we were able to play with a variety of compositions and props. And I find that's often what happens with the Aurora, is that you're in panic mode for the first 10, 15 minutes, or until you have your first decent shot that you like, and then you learn to relax because you have one in the bag and you start to get a bit more creative and a, bit, a little bit more elaborate with your compositions. So we spent about, uh, we spent about three more days in the Lulasat area, just wandering around and waking up with that inferno and struggling to capture the sense of scale. There's Steven over on the right top right and shooting the everlasting sunsets and we were very lucky with conditions it seemed like every night even though we had clouds at sunset every night the skies opened up to reveal the aurora dancing above the icebergs oh yeah and one night um, here's something cool we experienced one night Everybody has a dream. You have called Iluvaset Water Taxi. In a world with so little time and so much to do, we don't have all day to wait for your call. But your call is precious to us. So write an email or do the booking online. This is Barana. How are you? I know you know uh, my wife, Michelle. Is... IluvasetWaterTaxi.com your dream taxi. So anyways, I had to show one of his commercials because they're so funny. Uh, what, what do you know, eh? The Barack Obama's dream is to get on the Alulisat water taxi. So th this is a cool story. There's lots of cool people in Greenland. It, it attracts really different kinds, lots of different kinds of kind of eccentric people. And the owner of that little tiny yellow boat, is, his name is Anders. And he's, he's a guy who had a really, really well-paid job in, in, uh, in Sweden. And almost overnight, he just dropped everything, moved to Greenland, bought this tiny, like this tiny yellow boat, started to make you know crazy, like funny little commercials, and now makes a living off of just showing off the beautiful icebergs of the Alulasat region. And he does that full time, and he's absolutely passionate about the place. And he, um, yeah, he's he's just a dream to work with, and he understands what photographers are looking for. So he understands light, and he understands composition, and so he's able to take you to the really really cool spots. And he's always aware of those where those really gnarly icebergs are are hanging out. And he's got a knack for for just spotting them from so far away. It's, it's like he's got built-in binoculars. He he'll I remember being on a boat with him, and he'll say oh, there's something with an arch over there. And Dave and I and Steven are like, what is he talking about? And then sure enough, you know, after five minutes of just getting closer with the boat, we come across just some amazing chunks of ice. So he found some beautiful natural ice sculptures for us to shoot. This is probably, probably 30 meters high or so. Just 
just incredible features like this. And the next morning, we began the second half of the Greenland Adventure, which started with a six-hour boat ride across the Disco Bay to a to place called the Disco Island. And of course, we shot more icebergs along the way. I don't know, I, I probably ended up with 3,000 frames of just icebergs on this trip. We all got our fill of icebergs. And then we disembarked on an island that looks nothing like the rest of Western Greenland, really. It looks really, really different. For one, it's very rugged, and it was created less than 60 million years ago, whereas the main island of Greenland has some of the oldest rock in the world. It's 4 billion years old. So 4 billion versus 60 million, you're talking, you know, that means this island is 70 times younger than the main island of Greenland. And for that reason, it, it's, it's also a photographer's paradise, but a very different kind of paradise. It looks very much more like Iceland, I thought, having spent a little bit of time there. And it actually has 2,000 hot springs, which is not really something that people think of when they think of Greenland. So it's got a lot of geothermal activity. And like Iceland, it's got its, it's, got its ice-dotted volcanic black sand beach, except nobody's there shooting it, which is a nice, a nice change. And like Iceland, it's got just incredible columnar basalt formations those hexagonal pillars of rock all over the place. This is from a, a totally wild area called Kuanit, and it's a really, really hard place to describe. It's made up of crazy rock towers. This is probably 20 meters high. It's all made out of basalt and yeah, volcanic rock. And of course, you always have the icebergs floating past everything. And then it's got those crazy windows, which are great for self-portraits. Went back to play around there at night a little bit. And just incredible foregrounds everywhere you look. It's a little bit treacherous to get around, but it's just, for, for Dave, Dave said, Dave's been around quite a bit, and he said for him it was the most photogenic place he'd ever seen. And honestly, I find it hard to disagree. There is so much potential in those two square kilometers. It's just incredible, the possibilities. So we spent four days exploring the area. Uh, based out of the only village on Disco Island, Kekartaswak, which you, you see right here. Not quite as much ice as Lulasat, but still, still some pretty big chunks to, to work with. And we spent time going high up just to see what the icebergs looked like from higher altitudes. And we went back to the basalt gardens of Kwanit every day. And we stumbled upon some waterfalls, some good-sized waterfalls that, uh, that remain unnamed. That's the beauty about going to places like Greenland, is that you come across features which, if they were located anywhere else in the world, well, for one, they would be really busy and they, were, they would certainly have a name. Whereas you just come across those incredible features and, they, yeah, they, they have no name. The locals just call them the first waterfall or the second waterfall. And of course, we shot a heck of a lot of ice. Um, this is, uh, I waited such a long time for something to show up in that window, I was ready to give up. And then this, this, ice, this very friendly, convenient chunk of ice showed up just in the right spot. And it was still side lit by the sun, whereas I was in the shade. So I, I kind of liked the contrast. And more ice playing around with long exposures. And this is kind of the when you have um, repeating waves just um, bouncing against the shore and moving the iceberg always the same. It looks like a badly, it looks like a bad Photoshop job, cloning job, but that, that's just what the waves do to the ice in the foreground. Whereas you see the big guy, it's probably 50 meters high. It's very static in the background. Had to, had to do the disco selfie on Disco Island, of course. Uh, so every night we just eagerly awaited for the moon to rise and we, had our comp we knew exactly where it's going to show up. So we all, we all had our favorite chunk of ice that we wanted to shoot the moon over. And every night, like clockwork, shortly after the moon disappeared, we got the dance of the aurora. With just incredible colors. And every night we drop by our beloved black sand beach, which you see here. And we were just excited to see what fresh foregrounds we'd have to work with because everything is replenished every day by the waves and the tide. So, um, so this chunk of ice was there that night. It was gone the next morning, replaced with something else, something else to shoot. And same for the, ba the background moved as well and was 
evolving constantly. So it's, it's just a dream as a photographer to go stand at the same spot you were standing the night before, but you got a totally different subject to shoot. And the Mark III shutters just went nuts every night. And that's probably 10 minutes from where we were staying in the village. Until finally it was time to pack it up and go back over to Ilulisat, do the boat ride again, and back to Ilulisat for one last night out on the land. And uh, the Arctic had one last surprise for us, though. We actually, it felt like we witnessed the arrival of winter that night in Greenland. This is how the night, this is how the night started. With uh, actually full moon, but the aurora was bright enough to shine straight through it. And the night ended like this. And you'll notice there's two tents missing. That's because Stephen's tent, the wind picked up. Stephen's tent picked, uh, filled up with snow. And the, the boys said, we're, we're packing it in. We're going to the hotel. We'll see you in the morning. So, they, uh, so you're just 20 minutes from town there. So uh, they went to the hotel downtown in Lulusat. And uh, I decided to stick it out because it was, was my last night in Greenland. And, and shortly after, um, things opened up again. And, and I got the best possible farewell that Greenland could offer. Um, I got the, the, the full winter version of the place. Glorious full moon, the aurora came back out to play, but everything was so, so drastically, drastically different from what it was when I was first here uh, uh, at the beginning of the night. And I still remember just half, half asleep, just walking back through the village in the morning, and yeah, ha half awake because I'd been shooting all night, and just being amazed with the complete transformation. People were starting to get the, the dog sleds ready for a long winter ahead, and the, all the kids are out with their toboggans playing, and the, uh, the snowmobiles are roaming the streets, and it was like a totally different place. And the next morning, we found ourselves back to taking the obligatory cell phone shot through the airplane window, except this time we, had a, we actually had a clue as to what was going on under our feet. So Dave and I are super excited to go back there with 16 participants in September. Uh, and I think it's a trip we'll probably run every other year. And it'll really be an odd, for me, that's a big part of doing the workshops, is just see the look on people's faces when you finally go back, to, go back with them and they see the eyes or the aurora and to just see their reaction is priceless. And then, of course, there comes the part to helping them get their own images, but um, I, I love the whole process and I'm really excited to, uh, to be able to, to introduce people to this part of the world. So thanks very much, guys, for, for your attention. Thanks for coming. If you have any questions about Greenland or about any, any of the images, what went into making some of the images, um, you, can, you can ask away now. I'm also going to be at the Canon booth until, until the end of, of the day. And uh, yeah, I'd love to meet you guys. Any questions? OK. Um, so the question, the question has to do with settings for shooting the aurora. Um, for me, it has to do with two different things. Um, it's, it depends so much on how much moonlight is available, um, and it, depend, it really depends on the intensity of the aurora display. If, if, I, if, I have, if I have full moon or if the aurora is super bright and you have a fast prime lens and you're shooting at f2, you can probably get away with one second exposures. Um, and where, where I live, in the mid latitudes in Banff, Typically, to get the green to show, you're more looking at 10, 15, 20 second exposures because the aurora is a bit more subdued. Um, it varies so much. But usually, I would say, like when I do workshops and people ask, well, what's a ballpark setting to start with? If there's no moonlight to work with so whatsoever, I would say f2.8, 30 seconds, 1600. And then if you got, if you got full moon, I would say still start wide open at f2.8, 1600, but maybe start at five seconds or so and then readjust from there. Yeah, if your gear will allow it. Any other questions? Yep. Right, so on this particular trip, the question is how do we recharge the batteries? Um, I've, on this particular trip, we actually we felt like the best way to go was to just bring lots of batteries because we knew that we would get a chance to go to town occasionally to charge them up. Um, but I've done trip, 
you know, I've done trip in Iceland where I, I was 45 days alone, and then I had um, I had a solar portable solar charger where you just put it on your pack, and as you're walking, everything recharges, and those things are amazing. I had a Goal Zero one, and they're great, really portable, light, and um, yeah, you go for a walk, and by the time you get to your destination, you got a couple batteries ready to go. And but for this trip, it wasn't wasn't necessary. We were never we were never really, really far from civilization on this trip. And that's the beauty of Greenland. The, the line between wilderness and urban is just, it's just so sudden. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is about wildlife in Greenland. There's tons of wildlife in Greenland. It's mostly, mostly known for its marine, marine life. Um, and bird life, they kind of tie together. Uh, but there's also lots of large mammals on the land. Uh, it's one of the best places in the world for muskox. Like the first place we went to, Kangalusuak, you see them from the airport. They're all over the place. Uh, there, there's lots of muskox if, if that's what you're after. Um, there's a large population of caribou. No polar bears, which is a great thing for the landscape photographer. Um, it, which is interesting because if you go up to northern Norway, uh, to Svalbard, and if you go up to Arctic Canada, it's always something you're concerned about. You're always looking, it, everybody tells you don't stray from the snowmobile too much because if something comes, you have to be able to get to it before it gets to you. Um, but in Greenland, it's wonderful to not have to worry about that and look over your shoulder all the time and, and to just be able to shoot the landscape the way we do here with, without having that concern. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, if you're the kind of person who prefers to, to ask questions in private, just come see me or come drop by the booth, whether it's about Greenland or the gear or anything. Yeah, and one more question here. Um, the workshop this year is about, uh, next year in 2016 is going to be 5,500. Yeah, and you know, it's, they're not cheap trips for sure. And, the way Dave and I see it, it's, it's kind of the price to pay to be among the first to document a certain area. You can go to, you can go to Iceland for a third of the price, but you're not going to be alone there. And so it's kind of, um, when you, you want to go somewhere remote, then you have no tourism infrastructure and there's no volume, so the prices just go through the roof. Yeah, but it helps to go with a big group. We're able to keep the prices somewhat reasonable. It includes uh, flights from Europe. You have to get to Europe, yeah. Which for, for most people is the cheap flight, really. Yeah, <laughs> interestingly. Yeah, the, the, flight, the flights are crazy. I mean, it's way cheaper to go to Greenland than to go to Canada's north. It's, yeah, yeah, because there's so much more volume. Once you get to Denmark, there's regular flights up to Greenland. It's, it's, so it's cheaper. If you want to see the high Arctic, it's a lot cheaper to go through, to go through Europe, regardless of where you live in Canada than to go see the Canadian North, which is kind of unfortunate. It's kind of nice to see what our country looks like, but it's just so cost prohibitive. Any other questions? All good? Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it.